Thank you, Elise, for reading that so well for us. Um, I really wish I'd learnt to read that well in year six at school because this week I've been trying to work out how to pronounce half those names and now I know how to pronounce them. So thank you, Elise, for reading that passage. It's quite a difficult passage, actually. And honestly, during this week as I was preparing, I was thinking, boy, I should have just... For, you know, TCC's motto is centred in Christ and you want to be about the gospel, you know, you want to be about being centred. I thought, boy, I should have just gone to Colossians chapter 1. I should have gone to Ephesians chapter 1. I should have just gone to Hebrews chapter 1 and it would have been a lot easier. But hey, we're in the book of Judges. I thought we're not going to, we'll, we'll, you, those of you who are here from TCC today, you can just jump in on this series. Um, that is really, it's pretty heavy, it's pretty full on and you will feel the weight of this passage today. But let's pray and ask God to help us as we come to his word. Father, we thank you that you've given us your word and we've got books like Judges that are sometimes complex, confronting, but yet at the same time, Father, we want you to reveal the state of our heart. But at the same time, we want you to reveal your grace, your mercy, your compassion. And so, Father, as we come to this difficult passage, help us to know that we have you, not because of anything we do or bargain with you, but we have you because of Jesus and what you've done for us through him. And so today, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder, how, how, are, you at, how are you at bargaining? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, those of you who like going bargain shopping to like Cotton On or, or to JD Sports or the Myers where you go to West Point or Westfield and you, and you, get, you want to get a bargain, you know, you want 50% off or you want one for free. I'm not talking about that kind of bargaining, but I'm talking about how are you at actually bargaining for things? You know, how are you at bargaining when you have to use your words and your actions to try and get a result that you want to see achieved? Now, for me, in bargaining, it depends on whether I'm going to do it. It depends on how much value I place on the item or whatever. You know, if it's a dishwasher, I'm probably not going to try and bargain with the salesperson, but my lovely wife, she'll nudge me in the arm and say, hey, you should try and bargain a better price. How are you at bargaining? Now, now this week on, on Facebook, on one of my reels that popped up, it's obviously worked. My algorithm this week must have been something about finances or budget. And this reel came up with this man and this woman who were talking about finances, but how do you bargain to get to pay $65,000 for the boat that's for sale for $95,000? And I thought, I need to know that. And so I watched it, and for the next 15 minutes, she showed how through your words and your actions, you could bargain and get the better deal. She used her words, she used her actions, the salesman, who was, you know, was role-playing, role right? They were role-playing this out. He would use his words and his actions and bargaining. And eventually, she got to the end 15 minutes later, and she got the boat for $65,000. But my reaction was, I don't know, about you, but I felt there at the end of it, yeah, good on you. You're like, that's good, but I felt wearied and tired. I know you feel like that was a lot of work, a lot of effort. And I just felt the weight of that. And I was like, I don't know, I really want to do that. But I, I wonder, do you ever feel like that with God? Have you ever found yourself bargaining with him? I wonder, have you ever thought you maybe, maybe you are bargaining with him? See, today, I, I, there's so much going on today's passage, but I think there's one big thing that, uh, that you can pull away is that, that religion bargains with God. Grace gives you God. So today in this passage, I want, it's really, I think you need to understand is that, that religion bargains with God, but grace gives you God. And here's why it's so important that you actually hear this and understand it, is because if we actually go away today thinking that we can bargain, that religion is bargaining with God, and that's a good thing, what will happen is you'll probably walk out these doors and you'll feel like this week that you're going to owe God something. You may walk at the doors this week and feel the weight and just think, oh, man, there's more I have to, to do. And so you go out and you bargain. Or, or, or you may find yourself just overwhelmed by life that you need to pick your act up and do more to get the favour of God. It's, it's important that we understand this because or otherwise we'll walk away and our prayers will be shaped in a sense, like we want to bargain with God, you know, you're about to head into your HSC exam for biology and you walk and, like, and you just go, dear God, you cry out to him, I, want to, I need really good marks so I can get my uni degree. If you give me these good marks today, 
Even though you've been missing church, you've been studying hard, you haven't been going to youth, you're like, God, if you give me the results I want, I'm going to be at youth group on Friday night. I'm going to, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to commit. Or, or maybe for yourself, you're like, no, no, you cry out to God, I need financial security. And so you've got God, yeah, I, I know I'm not going to be at church much for a while. I'm going to have to put the 70 hours in a week because I've really got to get my mortgage. I've got to get my BMW. I've got to get my pool. I've got to get that paid down. And I've got to have some security. And I know it's going to cost a lot. But, but God, if you give me that in the next five years, after that, I'm going to tithe and I'm going to be committed to church life. You know, you might even cry out, you know, to give me, you know, give me early entry into uni. And, I'll, I'll, and you know what? I'll give you the rest of my life to serving you. And sometimes we even cry out. We grab the word of God and we treat it like a genie. You just get this mantra of you pull the Bible verses out and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it. And you're just sort of crying out expecting God will give you that. Bargaining. Religion is bargaining with God, but grace gives you God. And so today, we're coming to this passage. If you're here for the first time, we're in Judges chapter 11. We've been chopping our way through it slowly. But today, this passage really, I think, it's got a lot of bargaining going on in the passage. Last week, we saw Abimelech who did some brutal and evil things. He wanted to be king. And we saw and asked the question, where is God in this unjust world? And we saw that God does see the injustice and he does act in the world. And so today we're going to come to another story of Jephthah. We're going to, we're going to encounter him. And as we've been going through the book of Judges, I'm going to get a slide up on the screen. You'll see that there's been this cycle. If you're here for the first time, in Judges, there's this cycle that goes over and over again that just keeps repeating. And, and, and what you see in Judges is that the people of God, they rebel. They go into idolatry. God brings oppression. They go into ruin. Then they cry out in repentance. And then they get rescued. God raises up a judge to rescue them. And then whilst ever that judge is alive, they have rest and peace. But then, we, we, but then when the judge rests in peace, when the judge dies, guess what goes on? They go back to anarchy. And the book of Judges gets worse and worse and worse. And I reckon we come to almost one of the most horrific passages in the Bible today of the, the, the downward spiral of humanity, of God's people. So you look at verse 6 of chapter 10. You've got to go back to chapter 10 because it really starts there, the story. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Asherah. Right, it said they've done evil in the eyes of the Lord, chapter 2, 3, again and again. Here we go, they're doing evil again. But it's actually even bigger this time because you keep reading and they served Baals, but they... They served the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, and they forsake it. Like it's, it's really getting really bad. The evil is so bad that they've become so enslaved that in a sense, all those nations are telling us they are completely surrounded on the east, the north, the west, and the south by idolatry, by Canaanites, religion. They're caught up in paganism of the other nations surrounding them. And so they cry out to Yahweh. Have a look at verse 10. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving Baals. Now, that's a good thing, isn't it? You can actually come to God in an idolatrous way. You can come to God going, I want something from you, but I don't want you. God and so you use him to get what you want and I reckon that's what they're doing here because verse 11 helps us see that have a look the Lord replied when the Egyptians and the Amorites and the Ammonites are like I've freed you from them before didn't I not save you like we're here again you're just coming back because you're troubled and afflicted and you just want something from me and so God says, away with you. You know, you go and be enslaved to your idols. Go, go back and just do what you want. You only come to me when you're in trouble. And often isn't that the case with prayer? While the house is being paid, while the kids are behaving, while their job's going well, it's sort of quiet. But then all of a sudden when it goes south, we're quick to pray and reach out to God. God, I need your help now. And at the same time, our world wants nothing to do with God. The media wants nothing to talk about Jesus. And yet, when someone is tragically killed or hurt, what's the first thing you read in the news? Our prayers are with them. 
There's a sense in which we do it. And, and, and here's probably a helpful line. It's, Israel's treating God like a husband who commits adultery. The husband goes, you know what, I, I, I want to go elsewhere. And they go and commit adultery with another woman. He gets what he wants from her. And then she says, no, I'm done with you, mate. And so because he's getting something from her, he needs it back. And so he goes back to his wife that he committed adultery on and says, hey, dear, hey, honey, I'm back. And he just wants the benefits of having a wife. And that's really what Israel's doing, I reckon. They want the benefits of God without God himself. See, religion bargains with God, but grace gives you God. The first time they come, I reckon they're bargaining. But the second time, I reckon there's something's changed. Have a look at verse 15. We've, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best. Do you notice there's a difference there? They're now coming back going, no, no, okay, we understand. And so whatever happens, happens. Let it be up to you, God. See, religion wants the benefits of God without God himself. But Christianity says you get God in the suffering and the pain. Christianity says you get God when you're in trouble. You have him. See, religion says, I'll repent from doing good, from not doing good to doing good. So so here's what religious repentance looks like. It's repentance that says, I'm sorry that I've been caught out. I'm sorry that I've sinned. And so you repent and you turn to doing morals and righteous living. That's one way you can repent. That's not really the biblical perspective. No, no, the biblical perspective of repentance is that you turn from yourself, from being king or queen of your own life, knowing that I've turned from my sin, and you turn to King Jesus as king of your life, and that's what you, you rest in. And therefore, these other things will just flow out from that. See, Christianity, is, you're not getting something. It's, it's who you trust in. Whether my life gets easier... Or whether it gets worse, whether it gets harder, I know that the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. I lay down the pastures. And though I go through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. Why? Because God, Jesus, is actually with us in that. See, religion, it bargains with God, but grace gives you Jesus, God himself. And so if you've been with us for a few weeks, you'll know what the next step is in a cycle. God's going to raise up a deliverer, someone who's going to save Israel, and he raises up this judge called Jephthah. Now, if you were to read from verse 6 of chapter 10 through to chapter 12, verse 7, if you read it closely, after a couple of readings, you start to go, I start to be hearing the same thing over and over and over again. Now, what I mean by this is, is the way that you hear Israel sort of bargaining with God, you get to the story of this judge And guess what they do? They come, they despise, they reject Jephthah. He gets taken away. But they come back to him and say, oh, we need to be saved. And he says, you've just come to me because you're in trouble. You don't actually want me. You've shown me you don't want me because you despise me. That's what Jephthah says to them. And then, okay, that's that's a repeat of that first cycle. But then you get Jephthah himself. What's he do? He bargains with God to sacrifice a human to get something. So, so I think if you constantly look at these, there's these, these, these words and these actions of bargaining over and over again. God's people bargain with God. God's people bargain with Jephthah. And then Jephthah bargains with God. Because see, religion bargains with God. But grace gives you God. Because see... God's people here, they, de- they deserve judgment, but he withholds in his mercy. See, mercy is withholding from you something that you deserve. But not only does he withhold them because they should have been killed, he actually shows them grace by delivering them. He, shows them un- he gives them this gift of salvation. You know, some of you are bargaining with God. See, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it's not a message about bargaining with God. It's a message about what's already been achieved. See, the gospel, it's not about what you have achieved. It's about what Christ has achieved. See, the gospel, it's a message of good news of something that's already taken place thousands of years ago on the cross. See, in the ancient world, good news was a word that was used by the king who's won a great victory. And someone would run back to the city and say, hey, the king has won. And so the gospel of Jesus is a message of that. A message of his life, 
living a life that we could not live. He died the death that we should have died. He was raised from the grave, showing us that, that he really is the son of God and that he's had victory once and for all over sin and darkness, over death. He's done away with it. It's a message of what he's already achieved. And by faith, we receive it by nothing we do. It's not by bargaining. And we get God. We get God himself. Religion bargains with God, but grace, it gives you Jesus. I wonder how your bargaining is going. And so what I want to do now is I reckon I want to give you just two things to take away to remember. Two things that I think we need to daily remember as we come to a passage like this, and I think it's in there, that, that we need to remember. And the first lesson, the first thing that we need to remember is that you're never too far gone for God to redeem you. You're never too far gone. And why do we need to know this? Because here it is. When you think you're too far gone, you're going to bargain with God. When you think that, that you owe him something, that's, that's the moment where you, you feel like Christ's work on the cross isn't sufficient enough. Those moments where we have guilt and shame, those moments where we feel like, no, 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 God can't do that. that that's a moment where we, we go, Christ is not enough. But, but here we've got to be reminded, no, no, it doesn't matter how far you're gone, God can redeem you. Because Israel, this is probably one of the most lowest points in their history. Verse 1, look at chapter 11. Jephthah, the, the, the Gileite, was a mighty warrior. This is pretty good reading. And then, then his father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Now that tells you something about his father. Like he's, he's, he's gone off to have, you know, and he's had a baby, he's had a child to her. And, and, and he has more kids to his, his wife. But they grow up and they despise and they reject this guy. They don't want him to get the inheritance. He's a nobody. And so they despise him, they reject him. He gets kicked away and he goes somewhere else. And it gets a gang of scro 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 scrooges around him. Like, he becomes the next crime boss of Israel. Like, he's got a posse around him, and they're probably doing some pretty shady things. But then, even back in chapter 10, verse 6, 7, and 8, like, the seven nations mentioned, which is, in a sense, complete, they've, they're completely abandoned God. God says in verse 7, I've sold them over to idolatry in verse 7 of chapter 10. Now that's not saying that God's given up on his promises to bless all nations through Abraham. He's not saying I've given up on my covenant to, to make you a light on a hill. No, no, no. What he's saying is I've sold them over that the idols just own you. You're controlled by idolatry. You're controlled by these things. So Israel can go no further. They are evil and wicked, and Jephthah is despised and rejected. And yet God in his grace, he saves them. Why? Because God is more determined to save his people than his people are to save themselves. You know, there's a lot of language of idolatry in the book of Judges, and it's easy for us in the 21st century to just picture little wooden statues in the corner of our home. Or to, or to sit there and, and, and picture that it's, it's, it's what they do in Eastern religion, that, that they're the ones that have got these idols. We're in 21st century Western Sydney. But so, you know, we may not have that, but we actually probably do have idols in our own life. Like, an idol really is something that you just find security in. An idol is something you find significance and power. It's something that you turn to for those things. And here's an example, like you, you, here's an example of adultery. You, you, you won't be happy until your house and your pool's fully finished. You, you won't be happy until your kids get through uni and have a degree that you've always wanted for them. And in a sense, that's enslaved you because you need that for them, for you to have your happiness and your contentment and for you to have significance in this world. You need those things. It's just like money. So the idol of money, it's just so sneaky because money offers you power, it offers you significance, it, honors, it gives you honour in our community, it promises you all those things. But here's what happens with it, it, it catches you and it enslaves you, money does. Because you think in your head, I just need this house, I just need this much for my retirement, I just need this for my family, and so you work really, really hard, and you get that money, and it's in your account, and you get it, and you go, 
I'm not so happy after all. And so rather than saying no to the idol of money, right? you're not that smart to just go, oh, so sorry, no money, I'm going to let you go, you haven't given me my significance and my, my happiness. The idol just catches you even more and you go even harder into money. You notice how idolatry works? It just enslaves you even more and more. And you try to try and get out of idolatry, you just get enslaved to that idolatry over and over again. And what happens is it destroys you and your family and, and those around you, never satisfied, always wanting more. But God in his grace has but God in his grace, even though he's sold Israel in to themselves, look at verse 16 of chapter 10. And he could bear Israel's misery no longer. Or, or another translation might say, he pitied them. Now, I don't think this is a, because they've come back to God and said, I'm sorry. No, 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 this is, this is his, his misery. He, he pities them because he sees his people tied up in idolatry. He sees their miser miserable situation that they find themselves in. He sees that they are all consumed. He sees the depths of what's happening in their life. He is so moved and pitied by them. Their situation that in his grace and in his compassion, in his hesed love for his people, he, he sees it and he's broken and, and he delivers them from it. He raises up a judge. He sees them and he has compassion upon them. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For whilst we were still enemies, Christ died for us. You know what? You probably, you, you've already heard I said it last year, I, I love the motto of Toon Gabby Christian College, centred in Christ. I love hearing Vish and Bronwyn get up here and, you know, like to say, can you pray that as staff we treasure Jesus? That we give kids Jesus. Teachers, staff, us as a church, we can never give up on giving people Jesus in this complex world. Because kids have a tendency to bargain with parents. We live in a world that has a tendency to want to bargain and earn the favour of everyone else. You always need better marks. You always need a better, better win in sport. There's, there's always so much that's bargaining for our attention and, and our, our significance that, that actually we've actually got to get back and just be reminded that we're actually, as Christians, we're centered in Christ. Christ is enough for us. That we have to keep giving Jesus to each other to remind ourselves, no, 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 it's not about religion's bargaining with God. No, no, remember, you have everything in Jesus. Ephesians 1, praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We have Christ. So let's give Christ and not stop doing that. To remind people that you're never too far gone for God to redeem you. Religion says you're too far gone because you've got to do more. You know, I, I don't know about you, but maybe you, you drove here today and you had a bargain with God. You know, like, God, if you just get my kids in the car dressed with two pairs of shoes on and get them through the door, then I'm going to give some more money in the offering plate. Yeah, it's a bit small, but... But maybe it's actually bigger, really. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you, you, maybe you're addicted to sex. Maybe you're addicted to drugs I don't know what it is but maybe you're here this morning and there's a sense in which you haven't been to church for years but you've just made a bargain with God God you know if I turn up to church today can you just free me from my addiction to be reminded no, 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 you're never too far gone for God to redeem you you can't do it but by God's grace through his son of the cross God can be with you in this you know, maybe you're here and you're bargaining because your marriage is in a mess and stuffed up. Get me back with my spouse and then I'll serve. So religion bargains with God, but grace gives you God himself. And so we need to remember that you're never too far, you're never too far gone. That's, that's the first thing I, think I want you to, to remember daily this week. You're never too far gone for God to redeem you. But secondly, here's the opposite. I want you to be reminded that you're, therefore you're never too far away 
from forgetting God's grace. You're never too far gone, but, but we can be only a step away from actually forgetting the grace of God in our lives that we become so numb to the world around us, that we become so numb to the grace of God in our lives that we fall back into religion and bargaining with God. You know, in our social feeds, on the television, you've got to do more. There's a better body image. Do what makes you happy. There's always a bank account that needs more money. There's always a home that needs better things. There's always a family that, that, that needs to have a happier life. And there's a sense in which if I just get those things, my life will be better. And you bargain because you've forgotten the grace that you have in Jesus today. See, in pagan adultery, you know, thousands of years when this was written, you know, the way that you got things in life was you sacrificed to the gods, right? If you wanted a crop, if you wanted rain, you would sacrifice. You'd go to the temple, to the prostitute. You'd, you'd go and offer up animal sacrifice. You'd go and do these things to offer a sacrifice to God, the gods so that you could get things from them in return. But, you know, like, it's subtle sometimes in the 21st century. We don't do that. But I wonder how often we tell people you just got to do this and you'll get this. Now, there is wisdom in some of that stuff. You do. If you do X, Y, and Z, you'll get this, this, and this. But we've got to remember that we're not too far away from forgetting the grace of God in our lives. Have a look at verse 29 of chapter 11. Go to chapter 11, verse 29. You won't find chapter 20, verse 29 in chapter 10. But go to, to chapter 11, verse 29, and there's a hint here. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord's come upon Jephthah. In a sense, that tells us he's going to be a judge. He crosses over. They have a, you know, he's going to go into victory. Have a look at verse 30. And Jephthah makes a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. It means, okay, if you give me the victory, God... I will give you a sacrifice. We get to verse 34, and so he returns home. He's won the great victory. God's won it. And his daughter comes dancing because he's rejoicing because of the great victory out, out of the house. And we read in verse 34, she was an only child. There was no other son nor daughter. And when Jephthah sees his daughter, the first thing that comes running out of his house, he is devastated. I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break his only child his only daughter his only child his future is finished see in a sense that's what religion does with bargaining with God religion says I want a present now from you God but it takes you away from your future and that's the problem with the prosperity gospel and promises your present on favor from God right now but it strips you of the eternal reality of the new heavens and the new earth that God's with you now through what we face. Now, some people have tried to downplay this sacrifice. They've sort of said, ah, uh, Jephthah wasn't thinking a human sacrifice. He was just thinking an animal. Thinking, oh, well, that, that sort of makes, yeah, it, it sort of softens the blow. But if you actually really look at the text, it's, it's, not, it's not the case, right? Probably they, didn't have an, they probably didn't have too many animals living in the house, which probably eliminates that. But secondly, look at his reaction when his daughter walks through the door. If he'd made a vow that was about an animal, when his daughter walks through the door, he wouldn't have that reaction. It tells us that he really has made a promise that God going to do a human sacrifice. He's willing to go through it. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 31 says this, You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. Because in worshipping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fires as sacrifices to their gods. Israel know this. That's why God says you've got to clean the land from this spiritual cancer. But why does Jephthah do it? Um, I grew up in parks. 
It was a little country town. And growing up, you had Chinese. Eventually, we got Maccas. And I'm, I, probably wasn't, oh, and, and, and fried chips. That's really what I did. But I remember the day Subway came. It was like, this is a healthy option. You know, Subway, it's, you get to pick which bread you want. You get to pick whatever food you want. And so it's like, it's, it's a pick and choose your own adventure. You can take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And like Subway at that time, like I'm over Subway now, but back then it was like, it was wonderful. And so me now, my beautiful wife, we'd often go to Subway to get a bit of lunch. But to save money, right? You don't go two, six inches. You buy one foot long Subway. That's what you do. But what you do is you've got to keep the same meat right on there. But what you do is then, then you both pick what you want. Al will pick, you know, carrots and the, that, that spinach lettuce that tastes like zinc. That's really, and I'd pick, you know, mozzarella and more mozzarella. And she'd pick olives and, I, and I'd just pick plain lettuce. And, you know, you know at Subways, it's just like you just take a bit of everything. And by, not too long after that, you've got this sandwich that's just got everything in it. But what happens, this is what God's worried about, is is what happens is that the Israelites are made a subway sandwich of religion, Christianity. They've taken a bit of everything from those seven people, the nations around them and said, oh, we, we know God is who rescued us from Egypt, but we want a bit of every other God. And so before long, they've got a mismatched sandwich of religion, which we call syncretism, which is us in the 21st century taking the things and the religions of this world and morphing it with the gospel. And here's why I think we're so shocked by this story. The reason we're so shocked is because we're not numb to violence. We don't stand for domestic violence. We don't stand for abuse. We don't stand for those things in our culture and our society. But see, Israel's just become numb to violence. It's so much of it. See, last week, Abimelech, brutal. And yet, when he's dead, they just go home with no worries in the world. See, the people of God have become so canonized that even, I think, even Jephthah's daughter's daughter is okay with it. That they believe, they really believe that this is what God requires of them. That they need to do more to earn his favour. And why do we forsake and forget? I think we forsake and forget because we become numb to our culture. We, we don't really see what's going on sometimes, that, it's, that it's, not, <laughs> it's not the way God wants us to live. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was cutting up a juicy piece of watermelon. It was juicy, that's why I wanted to cut it up. And so I cut it, and I wanted a big slice, so I'm cutting it, and I wanted bigger, so I went this way, and it got really big, so I had to go back. But in the meantime, I did the stupid thing, and I cut my thumb, and it just, it just bled, like, you know, with red watermelon, and then the plate, and then the floor. You know, you can imagine the scene, and then I got my young Finley, who was great. I said, get some tissues for me, mate. Got some tissues, wrapped up, got some electrical tape, put it off, and we went back to cutting up the watermelon, right? <laughs> but, like, I'm about three weeks in, and my thumb is numb, Probably should see the doctor. But, but it's, it's, it's numb that, you know, if I hit it with a hammer now or I cut it, I really don't feel it. I, I, I'm not affected by it at all. And in a sense, the Israelites are just like that. They're not affected by the violence around them. They're actually so consumed in it. Because, see, the way to earn a pagan god's favour was to make a sacrifice to the pagan god. See, they're so numb to the culture that he believes that there is no... Jephthah really believes there's no other option but to sacrifice his daughter. Did you notice that? But God never said to Jephthah, I'll give you the victory if you do something. No, no, God's already promised back in chapter 10 he's going to have the victory. See, Jephthah probably would have thought, you know, he was an Israelite. Back in chapter 11 there, we didn't read, he, he, he knows his history, he knows his theology of God, he, he retells the story of Egypt, he retells the story of their history, he knows good theology, and yet he's mixed it all up that he, he thinks he's an Israelite, but he's, he's been affected by culture way more than he realises. And I wonder whether we are. But I wonder if we've become numb in the pursuit of materialism. Nice houses, nice cars. Just look, look at the houses that we live in. Look at the cars in our car park. All in the pursuit of a better life. Or we become numb to the the reality of of body image where we we believe that our identity and our worth is found in how we look. 
or that we believe and we become numb to think that the best thing for our kids is to get the best education they've ever had, that they get the best job, the best uni degree. Or I wonder if we find ourselves crying out to God, praying, God, if only you'd give me this boyfriend or this girlfriend. Or if you'd only just give me this job and this career. Forgetting the grace that we have in Jesus, who's with you. See, for religious people, God is useful. Oh, I just shared this a couple of weeks from Keller. For religious people, God is useful. But for Christians, God is beautiful. See, to bargain with God and say, if you would only give me this, means that we're forgotten the beauty and the wonder of the cross. That he's given himself for us at the cross of Christ. So you're never too far from numbing or, or you're never too far from forgetting God's grace. And I wonder, do you want God? Or do you just want something from God today? What have you become numb to? Or maybe today you're in just a spot where you feel like you owe God something. You, you recognise the, 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 the guilt and the shame that you've got right now from consequences, from sin from years ago that just overwhelmingly plagues you to this day. There's consequences to it. And so you feel like, I've still got to do something for you, God. You sit here and you pray, God, just, I, know, I know I've stuffed up, but from now on I'm going to try better and I'm going to try and fix it. What you need to hear is you actually need to hear that no, Christ is enough. You need to hear those words, it is finished from the cross. You need to actually hear those words from Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus faced our condemnation on the cross. See, religion bargains with God, but the gospel, the grace of God, gives you God. See, the judge who was despised and rejected by his own people... He actually points us to a better judge. See, he was despised and rejected. His own people didn't want him. He was from the backwoods. They wanted things from him, but they didn't want him. He, he had his unity of followers around him. And God raised him up to save these evil people. But see, this judge, Jephthah, he actually points us to a greater and better judge who was truly despised and rejected, who really, who really bore our shame and our guilt. The one who was born in... Interesting circumstances. He was at the backwoods of Nazareth. The, 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 the man who was born, God man, who was born. And he, he gets a followers of like tax collectors and fishermen. The one who was despised and rejected for us. The one, the, the better judge who would come and die for us so that we could become children of God. The, the judge who, who would not give up his daughter to sacrifice, but he'd give up himself to die for his church. And one of you holds out his hand and says, come to me all who are wearied and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace that we've received. May we never forget it. May we never move on from it. And help us to live in a world filled with bargaining, but help us to rest in the one who gives us eternal rest. Amen.